I, I first want to start with a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that we are at University Washington University in St. Louis, which is located on the ancestral lands of the Illini, Illini, Illini Osage and Missouri peoples who were removed unjustly and our community is the beneficiary. We honor our, our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. I also want to um, acknowledge uh, the, our co-sponsors, which are the Department of African and African American Studies and the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis, also known as CAM. So in partnership with CAM, we invited Professor Cooks to both speak at today's event and also uh, moderate tomorrow's accompanying, accompanying event, um, which is uh, regarding Ebony and Jet, which is a complement to um, a new exhibition entitled Lorna Simpson's Heads. Um, and this and that uh, exhibition explores the roles of, of uh, Ebony and Jet, Ebony and Jet, which are preeminent uh, Black publications in visual culture and media. But for tonight's event, we encourage you to. Uh, and for tonight's event, um, we also encourage you to submit any questions in the chat um, for the question and answer session that will happen at the end of this event. But now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Bridget Cooks and Lois Conley. So I'll start with uh, Bridget Cooks. Um, who is an associate professor in the Department of Art History and the Department of African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. And her research focuses on African American artists, Black visual culture, and museum criticism. Uh, uh, Cooks has worked in museum education and has curated several exhibitions, including Grafton Tyler Brown, Exploring California, uh, Pasadena Museum of California Art, and Ernie Barnes, a retrospective at the California African American Museum and the nationally touring exhibition, The Black Index. She's also the author of the book, Exhibiting Blackness, African Americans and the American Art Museum, which came out uh, University of Massachusetts Press in uh, 2011. And some of her other publications can be found in After All, After Image, American Studies, Aperture and American Quarterly. And she's currently co completing her next book, titled Norman Rockwell, The Civil Rights Paintings. Now I'm gonna introduce uh, Lois Conley. Uh, Lois D. Conley is founder and president of the Griot Museum of Black History. And she has dedicated many years towards researching African-American history with particular emphasis on the Underground Rail Railroad and the westward expansion. The Griot is the first cultural institution in St. Louis that is solely dedicated to revealing the broad scope of black history and culture. And it's only the second of its kind in the country. The, the Greer Museum of Black History opened as the Black World History Museum in February of 1997. And recently the Greer is working with the Monument Lab, which is a Philadelphia based nonprofit. Monument Labs Regarding Generation um, initiative features artists from 10 cities who will use public art installations to reimagine monuments in cities across, across the country. country. Artists and activists uh, wanted to bring attention to the role black women have made in the St. Louis region, which is awesome. Um, so without further ado, I'm really pleased to um, turn it over to Professor Cooks uh, for her lecture, um, which will be followed by the moderated discussion. Great, thank you so much, Hetty, for your introduction. Um, and I have to thank many other people, Tila Nguse, uh, Michelle December, um, Johnny Gabbert, um, and also I'm so honored to be able to share some space with um, Lois C. Conley, who is a legend in our field. Um, I'd like to also thank everyone at the Department for African and African American Studies and at the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equity at WashU. Um, and uh, along with Michelle December, the institution of uh, CAM St. Louis for working together to support um, my presence here. So um, it's a delight. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time to um, hear what we have to say. So I'm just gonna share my screen so that we can um, look at some images together. Okay. So I'm going to start with um, just talking about some of the research that I've been doing um, for many years now. Um, this is my first book called Exhibiting Blackness, African-Americans in the American Art Museum, which is um, just, we celebrated its 10th anniversary. 
And it's still a very relevant text um, to uh, the situation that we find ourselves in now. And, and the presentation I'm going to give discusses exactly that. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is really an amalgamation of ideas um, rooted in discourses of Blackness, art and museums. And my thoughts come from, even though I'm an academic, my thoughts are coming from my experience initially working at museums um, as an intern and then as a professional, primarily in education and different mainstream museums um, in the United States. And it's, it's that experience that really encouraged me to um, do my academic study, to become a professor, and then also um, to write this book. So in this book, um, I propose the following premise. Exhibitions of African-American art in American art museums have been curated through two guiding methodologies. The anthropological approach, which displays the difference of racial blackness from the elevated white norm, and the corrective narrative, which aims to present the work of significant and overlooked African-American artists to a mainstream audience. The former methodology reflects an institutional curiosity concerning the presence of racial otherness, commonly coupled with the desire to perpetuate the superiority of Eurocentric culture through contrast um, to a Black difference that's defined as inherently inferior. The latter methodology was formed out of the necessity to present art by African-Americans and correct for its, in, its historical absence and misrepresentation in mainstream art museums." End of quote. So in this book, I provide a context for understanding contemporary exhibitions of art by Black people um, by discussing our history in these spaces. And so during our time uh, together now, I'd like us to consider the anxieties that Blackness provokes for rethinking art history in art museums. The matter at hand concerns the ongoing pressures that museums face since the publication of Exhibiting Blackness to decolonize their spaces and rethink their functions. So I'd also like to posit that a key part of the exhibition process is our responsibility as students of the arts, researchers, viewers, writers, and critics to engage and respond to the work that museums do. So although the problems at the heart of questions regarding the future of Blackness in the art world today are tethered to, to those in my book, um, where we are right now reflects a very unique set of anxieties. Thinking through some of them brought me back to the title of Public, Enemy, Public Enemy's infinitely influential album, Fear of a Black Planet, from which I've taken the title of my talk. In 1990, Fear of a Black Planet amplified Black voices through hip hop by setting a new bar for turntablism, eclectic sampling, and danceable rhymes, combined with humor and politically astute uh, rhymes. Um, with this album, Public Enemy returned to the charts energized by their 1989 hip hop anthem, Fight the Power, made popular through Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing. And together, Public Enemy and Spike Lee made 1990 a very hot and pro-Black summer. Their follow-up album was this, Fear of a Black Planet, that gave us classics such as Welcome to the Terror Dome, 911 is a Joke, Who Stole the Soul, Burn Hollywood Burn, and the eponymous title track. And as a collection, the album testified to a Black presence that exists on a different plane outside of the legal protections of liberty and justice for all. The Black planet is a nation within a nation. It describes Black communities that become terror, terror domes when under attack from white supremacy and communities in which emergencies are not regarded by those who profess to protect and rescue those in need. The Black planet is instead a place that suffers through white appropriation and superficial misrepresentations of its culture. The album insists on Black political resistance and creativity as the antidote to anti-Black pain and loss. Fear of a Black Planet preceded the discovery of WASP-12b by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope by nearly two decades. Known as the oddball exoplanet, the pitch black planet lays outside of our solar system. And according to NASA, it is quote, black as fresh asphalt because it eats light rather than reflecting it back to space. 
So I can't help but draw parallels um, between the way in which we can describe uh, WASP 12B and the anti-Blackness uh, and resistance to it that's explored in um, Public Enemies album. The characterization of the aggressive Black planet that eats light resonates with the way in which anti-Black rhetoric describes Black Lives Matter activism as terrorism that threatens white supremacy as the norm. The cry against white supremacy and the institutions that uphold racial hierarchy uh, permeates fear of a Black planet. And now over 30 years later, that call against anti-Blackness resounds again in, res in response to the persistence of racism and superficial gestures in the name of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Anxiety around the absence of light and more poignantly the presence of darkness socially and astronomically presents deep anxieties around new ways of perception that threaten to distort previous laws of vision. Indeed, the art world crises around blackness concerns issues of racial parity and mixing that would force the reconfiguration of categories such as American art, modernism, and fine art distinctions on which the authority of museums bases its value. So we're living through historic times um, when it comes to art museums and the discourses of ethics, decolonization, historical truth and community engagement. Um, I just wanted to show these to you just because of course, as an art historian, we can see the formal um, relationship between NASA's image and uh, the image on the cover of PE's album. I'm just gonna talk through some recent examples that have really challenged uh, mainstream American art museums. And I really want us to think through some of these examples. I think some of these may be familiar to us that we read the headlines when they were published, but I, I want us to also think about where we're going. Um, particularly because I'm going to be in conversation with Lois D. Conley, who is someone who's known very well as someone who's been involved in and invested in Black representation to think about Black institutions, um, that these mainstream museums that I'm going to discuss briefly are now struggling with what do they do with Blackness? How do they represent Blackness in white spaces? And this is something that um, many of our um, important black creatives and intellectuals um, like Lois Conley have been doing the work already. Um, so I want us to just think about those two different struggles and um, where we're going in the future. So in 2019, the Metropolitan Museum of Art unveiled um, four bronze sculptures by Kenyan American artist Wengeshi Mutu, and I'm showing you her here. Um, I want us to look at, and I'll use my cursor so that you can see, she has these sculptures that were installed. They're no longer there. It was a temporary exhibition um, here and here and here and here. And these are alcoves on the facade of the Met that have been empty since the Met was built. And then in 2019, when Geshe Mutu was commissioned to make work um, that would be um, in that space. And I just want us to look at some closer images. The title of these works together is called The New Ones Will Free Us. And um, again, they filled these platforms temporarily um, and they had sat empty since um, 1902 when the museum building was completed. So when Geshe Mutu created these sculptures that reimagined ancient caryatids, which are these female forms that are used to uphold the weight of a structure. And here, what Mutu has done is created these independent um, black women um, who are not holding anything up. Um, and I think the symbolism there is really magnificent that they become, um, these figures that are kind of otherworldly, ancient and futuristic at the same time, they seem to be um, comfortable in this space as if they belong there. And that's traditionally not the relationship that the Met has had to, um, to Black culture. So I think that this work is a really terrific step towards making change to that long troubled history of colonization at the Met and Black representation at the Met. And I'm suggesting also um, 
that we as viewers and as patrons of the art, at least in terms of paying our fee to get inside the building, that we continue to make the museum accountable to the rest of us so that the artwork here by Mutu doesn't sit it as a kind of one-off isolated gesture, but signals the changes of uh, the treatment of black people inside the gallery. Um, and the Met has been doing some really interesting things in this direction, so I'm hopeful. Just for scale, um, I have this uh, photograph of Mutu making the work. Um, in 2019, the International Council of Museums, which is an organization that represents over 20,000 museums across the globe, met in Japan for its annual conference. This is all pre-pandemic, right? So on the agenda was the vote to officially revise the definition of a museum. And the proposed definition has divided its constituents, some of whom reject a new mission to promote justice in multiple forms for the planet and its people. So the new definition claims an active function for museums now. It states, quote, museums are democratizing, inclusive, and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogues about the past and the future, end of quote. It also states equal rights should be guaranteed by museums and equal access to heritage for all the people um, should be part of the museum's function. Now, this change was considered too radical for many of the council's members. And so the organization decided to postpone the vote for a new definition of what a museum is. And so far, no date has been set um, for that vote. Also in 2019, the Whitney Museum of American Art faced organized and persistent protests because of the investments, investments of Warren B. Canders, who served as vice chairman of the museum's board of directors. The protesters, including activists in the group Decolonize This Place, objected to Cantor's ownership of Safari Land, a company that manufactures the tear gas used against immigrants along the Mexico-US border. Many of the artists in the uh, biennial called for Sanders' resignation, which came later in July. And then a year ago, February, Newfield, a campus of gardens and art spaces that houses the Indianapolis Museum of Art, faced community backlash against the museum's posted job description for a new director. The ad doubled down on white supremacy saying that the museum was interested in quote, maintaining the museum's traditional core white audience end of quote. And while likely true, the statement conflicted with other statements by the museum that it was interested in diversity. Newfield's president, Charles L. Venable, resigned within days of institutional pressure. And this latest scandal followed the 2020 resignation of the museum's only African-American curator, Kelly Morgan, who has gone on record in video and print to tell all about the anti-Black conditions she suffered as a museum employee. In June 2020, Neil Benezra, uh, director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, actually former director because they just hired Christopher Bedford um, last week. Um, Benezra apologized for deleting comments by a black employee who called out the museum for its poor handling of anti-black activity within the museum and its lack of response to the murder of George Floyd, who was one of five men killed by police across the United States on May 25th, 2020. As the assertions of the hashtags Black Lives Matter, Decolonize This Museum, and Museums Are Not Neutral movements challenge and generally perplex mainstream museum leadership, some directors and curators are facing the legacy of white supremacy and social hegemony. In the last several years, American museum directors have disrupted regular acquisition and exhibition procedures in order to claim that Black Lives Matter in their institutions. And their efforts have been lauded and criticized. Um, I think this is probably um, the most radical and well-known um, gesture um, by Christopher Bedford, who again, until um, last week, I suppose he's still there, but he's on his way to San Francisco. But Christopher Bedford has been the director of the Baltimore Museum of Art. And he decided in April, 2018, that the museum would decession seven artworks all by white men in their collection in order to fund the accession of art by white women and artists of color. 
As a result, Bedford stated, quote, the BMA acquired 11 major works of art as part of the museum strategy to broaden the historical narrative of art and build a more diverse and inclusive art experience for Baltimore, end of quote. In October 2020, a second round of deaccessioning at the BMA was planned in an attempt to further diversify the collection, but the auction was called off mere hours before it began. The museum faced dissent from former museum trustees and board members who had disagreed with the sale, and two board members rescinded promised gifts based on the deaccession plan. In February 2019, um, SF MoMA, let me change slides, here we go. So this is just a headline. I'm trying to put the headlines with the dates and the titles so that if you wanna um, look this up, uh, anything up for more information, you can find it easily. Um, and so SF MoMA also tried to do the same thing in February, 2019, deaccession works. Um, and so they sold this um, untitled Mark Rothko from 1960 to purchase works by makers of different racial and gender identities. So these are uh, really bold gestures by museums to sell off their permanent collection in order to uh, buy more work. But I think these gestures um, or these activities are really um, unsustainable, right? I'm hoping that the boards and donors of these museums and others who patronize the museum will understand the seriousness of changing the permanent collection and commit to funding a transformational collection and exhibition practice um, in order to display them. Um, a few more examples that I think you're probably familiar with. Um, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio formed a committee to consider what should be done about several statues in the city that promote white supremacy. So one of these is uh, the familiar and troubling sculpture titled Equestrian Statue of Theodore Roosevelt from 1940 by James L. Frazier that has stood outside of the American Museum of Natural History um, since it was made. In 2019, the museum opened an exhibition called Addressing the Statue to educate visitors and invite them to share their thoughts about what should happen to the work. Um, the, uh, issue at hand, let me see if I have a better picture of it. Yes, so you can see the sculpture if you're not familiar with it, is that it shows an indigenous man and a black man who walk on either side of the president who rides above them on horseback. So a month after public protests against anti-black violence was sparked by the video recording of Minneapolis police officers murdering George Floyd, de Blasio ordered the removal of the statue. However, I just took this picture in September and the statue is still there. So I'm not sure what the holdup is, um, but uh, so far nothing has changed. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, another ongoing battle um, that has to do with the uh, postponement of the exhibition called Philip Gustin Now. Um, in 2020, the directors of all four museums that um, should be showing this exhibition agreed to postpone this project over concerns that they had not communicated appropriately with Black constituents in preparation for the exhibit. In particular, the museum directors worried over the potential response by Black viewers to Gustin's paintings that feature cartoonish Ku Klux Klan figures. The exhibition was planned to debut at the National Gallery uh, of Art in Washington, D.C. in June 2020 before traveling to the Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Houston, the Tate Modern in London, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So it's not clear how the museum directors expect the anti-Black climate in museums to change or why they believe it will improve by 2024, which is when uh, the exhibition would open. But suffice it to say that these museum leaders have agreed to pause their actions for a time of reflection and reconsideration. So the museum trouble that's going on now that I'm recounting is not new, rather it is ongoing. Its history of conflict between upholding white supremacy on one hand and representing people of color respectively as equals on the other is older than the museum itself. For African-American people, it has a very specific traceable history through exhibitions. 
And in fact, it was my experience of visiting and working museums that encouraged me to write Exhibiting Blackness. In mainstream museums in my work experience, I found the regular omission of art on view that had been created by Black Americans. And when there was an exhibition of work by Black artists, I noticed a few other things. First, Black artists were featured in museum uh, exhibitions that were group exhibitions about being Black. They were not regularly shown in thematic-based exhibitions organized around a particular style of art or a specific topic. And rarely was their work shown alongside artists who were not Black. Second, the object labels for work by Black artists stated that the artists were Black. However, labels for work by white artists did not identify them as white. And third, when an exhibition of works by Black artists was on view, many of the museum visitors who commented to me about the exhibition who were not Black stated that they had never seen work by a Black artist before, and they thought that this exhibition of Black artists was the very first of its kind. So there are many examples that I can give you that precede the recent ones that I've recounted, some of which you can find in, in my book. Um, and for those of you that are interested in this history and wanna know more, I'll just very briefly talk about one example um, from the text, which is Harlem on my mind. This is the most, this is one of the most notorious exhibitions in American history. I think the other one would probably be the Enola Gay exhibition. Um, but this exhibit, the full title of which, um, Harlem on my mind, cultural capital of Black America, 1900 to 1968, was organized by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1969. And it was an exhibition that sought to trace the history and value of the predominantly Black community in Harlem and New York City. In organizing one of the most controversial exhibitions in national history, the Met decided to exclude people from Harlem from participating in the planning of the show and to exclude artwork by Harlem's thriving artist community. The museum justified these decisions by arguing that Harlem itself was a work of art and the inclusion of actual artworks in a show would only detract from the overall exhibition. Much more to say about that, but I'm going to uh, keep going. I do have some installation shots for you to see. So the exhibition was um, reproductions of documents and photographs. And in 1969, um, photography was not considered art. It was considered images made by machines. And for the most part, with some exceptions because of Steichen at MoMA, um, photographers were not considered artists. And um, most of the photographs that were in Harlem on my mind were not taken by black photographers, but um, some of them were, um, such as this work by James Bandersee. I wanna share another example of the continuation of the anthropological and really sociological approach to showing art by black artists that I talk about in Exhibiting Blackness. So every 15 years or so, either the Museum of Modern Art or the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. decide to exhibit Jacob Lawrence's complete 60-paneled artwork, The Migration of the Negro, that he made between 1940 and 1941. Its most recent presentation was in 2015, when MoMA displayed Lawrence's work in this exhibit called One Way Ticket. Basic elements of art, such as color, line, and shape, and composition and common sources for analysis such as artistic style, influences and innovation were not part of the curatorial presentation through wall text or object labels. Although the work has very strong narrative content, there is a thoughtful formal relationship between the message of Lawrence's work and its medium. And at MoMA, the migration of the Negro was presented less as an artwork and more as documentary illustration. The curators made a bank of computers central to the presentation. So I'm just uh, giving you some installation shots so you can see leading up to the work, there was this um, timeline of uh, social history for context. Then when you went to the show, there was this bank of computers um, in the room. Through digital content, the exhibition presented a team of experts of African-American culture history professors, authors, curators, and performers to provide what the title will 
title wall called, quote, Other Visions of the Great Movement North. And they formed a supplement to Lawrence's art, an informative source on the Great Migration, and ultimately um, a distraction away from the focus, which was the actual art that was in the room. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly quote a review of this exhibition that I really like by a scholar named Elizabeth Berkowitz. And she has a very astute analysis of the show and she says, quote, despite seemingly universal critical praise, MoMA show failed to avoid the difficulty endemic to art historical emphasis on a non-white and therefore non-canonical artist. In a painstaking attempt to showcase in Laud Lawrence and his work, a parade of good intentions, MoMA's one-way ticket inadvertently accomplished the opposite. The exhibition fell into the trap of artistic pigeonholing. As the exhibition classified Lawrence as a painterly historian of African-American history, rather than an American artist who used the visual and political interests of an interwar international art scene to create works which focused on African-American subjects, end of quote. And so Berkowitz argues that MoMA treated Lawrence as an anthropological native informant and reinscribed racial hierarchy within its collections and in turn, its exhibitions. In other words, the museum was doing too much to cover for its racial anxieties. So um, close to closing here, I want to return to the fear of a black planet and share more examples of anxieties around activating and owning blackness as a way of seeing. So one example begins with artist Anish Kapoor's uh, 2016 purchase of the exclusive rights to Vanta Black, known as, quote, the world's blackest black substance, end of quote. And the substance was developed by Surrey Nanosystems for satellite-borne black body calibration systems. The substance absorbs 99% of light, making the visibility of an object completely disappear into darkness. And um, for the slide that I'm showing you, if you look at those images on the bottom right, what you're seeing on the, the furthest to the right are two objects that are exactly the same physically, but the one that appears flat and black is covered with Vanta black. Um, and then when you're looking at the second image closest to the center, you're looking at this kind of foil that has this um, shape, uh, geometric shape in the middle. And then you'll see how that shape um, looks completely flat because it doesn't reflect any light. So Vanta Black has been used by the United States um, and, uh, and England for stealth weaponry and detection systems. Described as having the ability to make the experience of looking at any object into feeling like you're looking into a black hole, the liquid became appealing to visual artists interested in appropriation for illusionistic possibilities. It also engendered hostility from artists who resented Kapoor's exclusive rights to the blackest black particularly from white British post-pop artist, Stuart Simple, who started a successful Kickstarter campaign to make a blacker black, black is black substance that would be available to all artists. And this is a cartoon that um, Simple created to um, advertise this new substance. Pitched as the blackest, the maddest paint in the known universe, like a black hole or void in a bottle, Simple wasn't alone in his desire to access the blackest black. He exceeded his Kickstarter funding goal after 38 hours and manufactured the substance Black 3.0 in 2018. In August 2020, the color development company Pantone announced Ultra Black, a color inspired by a song with the same name by hip hop icon Nas. Here is an extended quote from the company describing the project. And I'm gonna to try to read this without my, my own commentary. A testament of the times, Ultra Black is a statement to being unapologetically pro-Black and thus pro-humanity. While the color black often connotes feelings of darkness, Nas reimagines the term to represent its richness, complexity, and profound beauty. An electrifying phrase honoring the black community as the life force of culture, 
The term extends beyond race, class, or creed. It is symbolic of the fortitude, power, legacy, and interconnectedness of all people worldwide. Just as Black absorbs all light, Ultra Black represents the unification of all people, spotlighting Black joy and the promising future ahead. Okay, end of quote. So what's immediately remarkable is how at every turn of phrase that focuses on Blackness, the text moves away from the color to represent humanity. I mean, this is a, a kind of um, uh, movement that we're all familiar with when we think about um, people who were resistant to Black Lives Matter and they wanted to say all lives matter. And then you had to explain to them how those are not the same thing. So Pantone creates Blackness in order to disarm its darkness and transform it into something for everyone, right? So we have a whole history of appropriation um, to thank for this. Plenty of examples of this happening over and over again in, in many different fields. Proceeds from the sales of ultra black swag by Nas are designated for charity. And I think charity is code for black organizations here, but I'm not sure they don't list uh, the names of the charities. But my question here is what is this rush to own blackness? It's color, it's optical abilities to change perceptions of physical dimensions and its association with black excellence. How can we characterize this interest in manifesting and owning the purest black, a black that changes vision and defies the perception of dimensionality in space? As I've just indicated through my own interpretation of Pantone's ultra black, part of the answer is the desire to own blackness in order to appropriate it and ultimately destroy it by redefining it through white access. At the heart of this and other answers, the relationship between Black as pigment and Black as form is key. It's something that artists have been wrestling with in the artistic philosophies they, they have had for generations. In 2015, a joke was discovered underneath Kazimir Malevich's 1915 suprematist painting called The Black Square. And I'm showing you here an image of someone, a photograph of someone looking at the painting on the wall. Described in the New Yorker as, quote, the most famous, most enigmatic, and most frightening painting known to man, end of quote, the revelation of the hidden text offers new interpretations of the Black mon monochromatic. And the white border of the painting is a message in Malevich's handwriting that translates in English as Negroes battling in a cave. The artist's racist joke transforms the painting into an image of black flesh and conflict and equates the color black as a representation of people of African descent. As filmmaker Arthur Jaffa has explained, the implications of accessing the embodiment of black people through modernist abstraction demands some major reconsiderations of the conceptual origins and parameters of modernism itself. He says that we need to consider several things how black bodies activate space, or the volumetric intensity of black bodies in cities, the attraction of the entropic, the state of disorder and decline, modernism as a substrand of black aesthetics, and the black body as a premier anti-entropic figure in the 20th century. The trauma provoked by the introduction of black body into white space is profound. That's the end of uh, Jaffa's quote. So Malevich's description of his painting references blackness in social space and opens up another understanding of the debt that modernism owes to black people and the phantasm of blackness in the white imaginary. In matters of perception, experience, and force, blackness shows its relevance for art and visuality. Its interpretation demonstrates the facts that black lives matter and black art matters. And I'll end um, in a moment with a thought that comes from visual studies scholar Keith Moxie. And he um, describes the difference between representation and presentation that I'm going to um, paraphrase here. So as viewers, we engage with artwork on at least two registers that we can call presentation and representation. So there is a visual re representation, sorry, there's a visual presentation of the object that has a presence that takes up space in the gallery. It's an object, it's hung, it's lit, it's visible, um, it's presented. And then there's representation, which is how we perceive and understand what we see. 
What do we perceive as the subject matter? What is depicted in the pictures? How is it depicted? Our job in viewing, thinking, and writing is to pay attention to both registers. We should let the art signify and be challenged by it, not in fear, but for the possibility of new ways of seeing. We will only see Black futures in museums that are different and more di dimensional than we've seen in the past when curators and directors confront their fears of a Black planet. And it's an inevitable place created by white supremacy. Um, the museums are scrambling to deny and control this Black presence. The foundations of art history are at stake and the evidence of Black brilliance blinds the gatekeepers who are truly afraid of the dark. Um, I want us to turn towards, I'm really at the end now, I want us to really turn towards um, the work that's happening um, in Black museums today. And uh, in these last two slides, I want to focus on this article that just came out last week about Cameron Shaw, who's the director of the California African American Museum um, in Los Angeles. Um, you know, this is one of several important Black museum spaces that are um, doing particularly important work right now. Um, and, you know, I'm leading up to the work that um, Lois Conley has been doing um, at the Griot Museum. And um, I wanted to lead up to this by thinking through the way that Black museum spaces are struggling to survive, but have been surviving. Um, and I wanted to point this out because this is a museum that has an all black, all female leadership team who just um, uh, came up with a collaborative partnership with another black space uh, in Los Angeles that's run by Mark Bradford, who's um, a very well-known and well-respected African-American abstract artist who has his nonprofit gallery and um, social workspace for foster kids called um, Art and Practice, which is not very far away from camp. And so I, I'm looking uh, to this article, I'm looking to Cameron Shaw and Mark Bradford as cultural leaders to help us strategize and create new ideas for how um, Black spaces can survive and thrive. Um, and then I'll end by turning our attention to the work that's being done here in the city um, and, and ask that, um, that Lois uh, come on screen so that um, we can talk about um, some of these issues I've discussed and, and the work that she's been doing. I think I'm there. Yeah, I see you. Hi. Hi. Good. Thanks, Bridget. This, you know, is, is really interesting. Um, I guess 10 years ago when I first picked up a copy of, of your book. Oh. Um, just just out of curiosity and wanting to learn a little bit more about art and, and Black artists, um, never even occurred to me that I might be sharing this space with you. Oh. Meet you <laughs> this, it's my pleasure. Many, many years later and be sharing this space with you. So I'm, so I'm really, really excited and really pleased and honored to have been asked to participate I uh, feel the same way. Yes. Really, really thanking Cam and thanking uh, the Center for um, um, Race and Ethnicity and, and WashU and the Department of African and African American Studies for this opportunity and, and hopefully for the beginning of a long term relationship. Mm. Uh, because that tends to be what happens with my relationships at, at WashU. They just keep growing and blossoming and um, making new opportunities for the GRIO. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm really happy about an, a yet another opportunity to do that. I was impressed as you started to talk about uh, your journey uh, with a question that keeps, um, I maybe I struggled with even in the very beginning of the founding of the GRIO was um, whose role is it uh, to change this, this perennial uh, issue uh, that is, you know, we have to just say it based in race and racism. Mm -hmm in regards to how our stories are told. Who, who tells our stories and who determines how they get told? Uh, is it the role solely of the Black Museum to do that? Or is it the role of us as Black institutions to help our sister museums, brother museums do that? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think about this a lot because um, there's a lot of tension and frustration and I think, uh, quite frankly, bitterness 
um, between white institutions and black institutions. I think because um, mainstream white institutions, and, and that's, I'm, I'm putting those two things together. I know that there are people who are not white that work in leadership positions in mainstream museum, but it's a very, very small percentage. Um, and it's, it's relatively recent, right, that we can really count in double digits. Um, but I think it's a, it's the situation that we in, that we're in calls on uh, multiple strategies. It calls on multiple strategies um, in terms of people who are, I mean, I, I can't even say I was going to say people like you. There's you, there's no people like you. Um, but to found a museum, you, you know, you found it, you're the president, you're the CEO, right? It's like, it, this is something that um, you're doing. Um, it's a labor of love, but it's an intellectual and activist project, right? So we have to have our own institutions where we can model how things are done, but we also have to continually put pressure on museums from the outside and also try to work from the inside to try to make change in those spaces. So. I mean, I've talked to people, particularly um, African-American museum guards, because that's where a lot of African-American people have a presence in museums, this insecurity. Um, and they have said to me, you know, we appreciate your work, but why should we care about these white museums? And, um, and I love that because we don't have to care. We can make our own spaces. Um, I am always interested in, in, in the struggles that have happened before me to try to help me figure out the ground I stand on. Um, and so I think, you know, I've said this before when I'm talking about my book, it's helpful for uh, black people who work in museums to know where the bodies are buried, you know, to know what that history is and where they might be able to intervene and create new directions. But so we need to support, I think those efforts that um, point museums in a new direction, but we can't wait for mainstream museums to do the right thing. It's not, you know, we'll be waiting forever. And so we have our own museums with our own focus, with our own boards, with our own audiences um, that are really focusing on black people there to educate everyone, right? But, um, but there is a way when you have a black institution that there's so much that we already agree on. We're not going to have to argue about black value. Thank you, thank you. And I guess the follow up to that would be, if if it's our responsibility to, to create our own, do we always want to be separate, or do we want to, you know, gradually? Is our goal to to mm -hmm. change the status quo, in fact, and make that difference, so that we're not always struggling to make sure our voices are heard and our artists are seen and our you know, yes. is, their, their talent is respected in the same way. I hope that there's a point where it's less of a struggle. But I honestly don't think that, I don't think even, I'll, I think you'll have different answers from different people. My goal is not to eradicate Black museum spaces okay. by transforming the museum. You know, it's not like ultimately we won't need the Griot Museum. It's like, no, we're always going to need the Griot Museum. You're always going to be able to find something there that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else, right? But we need to, um, um, I mean, part of this, part of the reason why is because we need to, in my thoughts, always expand people's definition of Blackness. Um, and so we need to have Black spaces and we need to have the white spaces, the work, even if you show the same work, in both spaces, it's going to read differently. You're also gonna get different audiences, right? Because not everybody that goes to SLAM um, is going to go to the Griot Museum. There is some overlap, but those are also for the most part, different audiences. But I know Renee Franklin, who we all adore, um, has been fighting a good fight and doing really proactive work um, at SLAM. And so we need to support what she does and we also need to support what you're doing. And I don't see those are competitive as competitive things, but you know, by people being introduced to maybe by surprise um, going to um, the St. Louis Art Museum and finding black artists, they might be more apt to come to the Greer Museum 
and it'll be less of a struggle if they really support what you're doing there. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty accurate and pretty much the path that we've we've taken at the GRIO. We one of the things I knew we wanted to do was to be a safe place where our artists could come and display their works. And right. it wasn't judgmental. It wasn't anything about a standard. It wasn't you know it was like you're an artist and you have uh, something to display and, and, and in displaying it, you have a story to tell. And we want mm -hmm. to encourage that and be a place for you to do that. And also mm -hmm. the other part of that was to be a place where maybe um, some of the pieces that this, that Slam didn't want or that Renee couldn't convince them to buy or display, they could you know, find a place at the GRIO. So I, I'm hoping that you're fun. correct when you say um, there'll always be a place for the GRIO. Uh, because of things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, can I ask you a follow up question? Because I think some people in the audience know, but some maybe didn't, don't know about the work you're doing with um, the Monument Lab and the funding you've gotten, because that's, that's an important project because it's about your space, but it's also taking it outside. And so, you know, we don't think of just public, public art as being the mainstream, but it's not a safe black space. And there's a way in which your project I think engages with that if you wouldn't mind telling us more about that. Yeah, and it's it is pretty interesting because it's an evolution of you know some 20 years of getting to this point. Uh, but you know finally creating I guess a, a, a sense from somebody that our work is important. Um, and for us being able to take, I was I just had this conversation earlier today, being able to take the work that we do within the walls of the GRIO outside mm -hmm. and to, you know, expand the work that we do to different locations and to different people and to, you know, to get different responses uh, from people who view that work. So it's a really exciting project for us. It's one of the biggest projects we've done since we've been uh, around. And it's a little, it's a little intimidating. Yeah. Uh, but it is um, <laughs> at the same time, very, very rewarding. It's an opportunity even for the GRIO to expand our own uh, collection and interpretation of black women in this city. And okay. you know, um, we don't get much attention as black people in period and women, black women get even less. And so this is a great opportunity for us to do that and to have the support both um, the staff support, the moral support, and the financial support mm -hmm. from Monument Lab to be able to do that. Uh, as, you, as we speak, one of those things, the mantra for Monument Lab is we must change monuments. Monuments must change. Okay. And so even as we're having this conversation about, I guess, mainstream museums, that comes to mind. Monuments, museums are in a sense monuments. And so mm -hmm. the way those monuments operate must change. That means they need to start to looking, to my, my opinion, they need to start looking at the systemic reasons why they treat black art the way they treat it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then really making some changes. Uh, so, so this is the, you know, the, the project is a project, but it's much broader than, than that project. So I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm excited about it too. And, and just to be clear, you're going to be marking important spaces around the city. Yeah, what we're currently doing is we're doing research. We've, we, in fact, we have a, a small community engagement project now where we're asking the community to go to our website and nominate women who they think have important stories. And this, when we say important, I'm not talking about someone who has great fame or great, you know, we're talking about women, the grandmother in the, on the neighborhood, on the block that you could go to and get a meal or get your shoes, you know, just women who deserve to have their stories told. So mm -hmm. we're asking people to nominate or recommend people who we can do some further research on and then look at how we can, how we can uh, create those memories and mm -hmm. then mark those memories throughout our city. So that's, that's what we're looking at now. And it's a, I mean, it's, it's an ambitious project. <laughs> it's totally transformative, you know, with all the trouble that, we as a nation and internationally have been having with questioning our monuments. I love the idea that you're like, it's time for a new definition of monument. Right. And it's difficult if you're going to try to, you know, if we're looking at monuments that exist of Confederate soldiers and captains and that kind of thing. Okay, well, you're automatically excluding most Americans. Exactly. Right. If you have this kind of criteria of um, celebrating people that had uh, government power. 
right? Or military power. Well, okay. But if, if we're if we're trying to be inclusive and really think about what our values are now, we're gonna to have to change the criteria. Mm -hmm. So I, I love, it. I mean, it's a revolutionary transformative project. And I think it's really empowering too, you know. It is empowering for us as a small institution because I think it gives us that authentic, authentication, is that a word, authenticity? It is now, authenticity. yeah. Authenticity that. Okay somebody has decided is important, uh, you know, but we, we never thought it was important that we have it, but you know, the wider community thinks it's important that you have a certain sense of validation from somebody. And so th mm -hmm. that, that helps to do that. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna do what we do with or without it, uh, you know, that validation. So right. it, it helps, you know. That is one of the things I, I think I said about the difference between the mainstream institutions and the, the Black institutions. The Black institutions aren't having arguments about Black value. That's not, a, that's not something we need to talk about. We're already, that's why we're at the table. We already understand that as the, the common denominator. Yeah, our, our priorities are how do we keep our doors open so that we can yeah. continue, continue to be important uh, institution in our community so that we continue to be a space where our people's stories can be had, be told in whatever way that is, you know, um, and it's, it may be a photographic exhibit, it may not be, it may be a, a spoken word, it may be whatever. And I don't think what the what is, is even as we were talking about um, the museum definition mm -hmm. earlier you were reading and talking about that it occurred to me that what difference does it make what it's called um you know <laughs> it, it, to me it matters more what it does than what it's called and so <laughs> i was like why are we spending time on that and i i see that as a way as a diversion mm -hmm. away from the kinds of really in-depth conversations we should be having i totally agree and i think I mean, I can't read their minds, but why would there even be resistance to that whole premise? It's like, well, what are you doing? And if you change the definition of a museum, then some of these museums who aren't interested in the kind of engagement that you're doing will feel pressure. You know, I think once museums open their doors to different perspectives on the walls and in terms of um, programs and community engagement, they're so afraid to lose their authority. And until the inside of the museum changes in terms of the staff and leadership, um, they can't be an authority on everything. Right. You well, know? And I, I don't know, do you think it's as much about losing authority as it is about losing power? Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and I Once think part shared, of when you mentioned I, earlier, the few numbers of us who you see in mainstream institutions, you know, we are there, but many of us don't have any power or authority right. to do anything or make any major decisions. Right. You know, um, so things, things don't change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we're having this problem there. Um, you know, I think the equity and diversity inclusion, uh, you know, for some places it's just kind of a, let's make a committee and get on with it. You know, let's put some people in a task force and, you know, let's keep doing what we're doing. Um, at best, they will hire an African American person and then make that person responsible for equity and inclusion. And, and then everybody else just does what they were doing before. So that's, yeah, that's not change. Mm -hmm. And it's so disheartening for the person who's hired who really wants to make change. But um, that systematic change has been just located in that person's body and has nothing to do with uh, the rest of the institution and how they um, might move forward. So um, we're still uh, at an impasse, I think, when it comes to these issues. Well, you know, this is, we didn't just start. This didn't begin <laughs> last week. Um, so the, you yeah. know, the chances of it getting changed uh, real quickly are pretty slim, but I think we have to keep fighting for that change, uh, whatever form that takes and you know, however it plays out. But I think there's a role for us and I think there's a role for us 
uh, and you might speak to this as well, what you think the role is for Black institutions in terms of really affecting those changes. How do we, what do we do? How do we do? How do we, how do we make things happen within the larger institutions? You know, I think um, the only thing that really gets big institutions attention is money. money. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I think gets their attention. Or lack of it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you can get a big multi-million or like a million dollar grant from somewhere that's going to validate you, right, then people will start to pay attention. Oh, you know, this foundation gave them money. So now it's safe to work with them. Or this found, you know, they, they have the attention of these collectors or they just got more land or something like that. Once you start to have more capital, and I think these institutions that have uh, larger and more reliable funding streams will start to pay attention. Mm -hmm. But they have plenty of opportunities to reach out now right. and say, why how can we work together? You yeah, know, why do they have turn... to be forced to do it? I mean, and that is the history. That is the history. It's a history of force, it's a history of shame and force mm -hmm. um, that has made uh, mainstream museums change. They don't have to do that, but that is. I mean, I've done the research and you're part of this history yourself. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we can speak with knowledge, um, you know, that that is true. So it seems like it would be a good idea for museums, instead of trying to invent um, a kind of authority or invent uh, at least a, a sense that they can represent black people and black culture that they would reach out for the people uh, to the people who already know this as their expertise and say you have something you have knowledge you have experience that we don't how can we work together and to really do it on terms that benefits both people you know both institutions so there's plenty of opportunity to do that. Um, and we have some examples of that happening, but um, I don't think enough. People are very territorial. Yeah, and even, I think even we are too, because <laughs> in, in a sense, I am, uh, we, I think we are really have some concern that about how we keep some of that insensitivity out mm -hmm. of our museums and out of our programming out of you know we don't want it to dissipate in a way that it is no longer meaningful mm -hmm. uh, to our people and to the artists and 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 humanities people that we represent mm -hmm. um so it's, it's a, I, I can see where it, it is a you know a, um a challenge and that's from that history i mean this is in inside the art world but outside i mean this is this is a yeah. history of, of racial antagonism so we yeah. see that in the museum and as you said you have a safe space you know so that's one of the things that i can imagine you're always concerned about you want to make this a safe space where if you're an artist you can show your work if you're a poet we can have poetry night you know what have you and once you start opening up you run the risk of not having as much control over that space. So, yeah. so yeah. that, yeah, that is the situation, I think, yeah. on both sides. Uh, wanting to attract more funding sources that, again, is more limiting, it has the potential to limit your, uh, what you can do as well. And you know you need it to operate, but you also don't want to, again, you don't want to water down what your programs are. You want to mm -hmm. be able to continue to operate. Um, mm -hmm in the way that you think that your mission suggests that you wanted to operate. So it's 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 a challenge. Um, I just wonder though, if in the long run, the major institutions have to, don't have to think, if, if in the long run, the major institutions wouldn't be well served to appreciate, I think what you mentioned earlier, the fact that there are some folks who not only have expertise and, and histories and, but we have lived experiences that make our interpretation and our presentations just a little bit different than yours. Mm -hmm. Even as I'd like to say, and I believe that African-American black history is part of American history. It is indeed, but it is African-American history with a twist. 
-hmm. that you you don't have if you are in a mainstream institute if you're among the that that group of yes um, and it's not it, it's not judgmental it's just fact right mm -hmm. there's a lived history and a lived experience and we can say that about you know any group that we're not a part of you know sure. you need to reach out and say i would like to do this project would you like to lead it how can we support you because you know things that we don't know? I don't think that museums are ready to say we don't know. Yeah. And then if you don't admit that, how do you learn? How do you do better what you do if you don't ask the questions or if you don't admit your, your, your shortcomings? Right. And it's not a secret that they don't know. We know <laughs> they don't know. Like we all know you don't know. <laughs> you know, whether you admit it or not, it's just true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we need more brave people to say, we're gonna try this, um, but there's a lot of resistance to it as well. But experimentation um, I think, can be good though, you know, even, yeah, even as, as you know, difficult as it may be, you might learn something. And then something might actually change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm getting a note that we're out of time. Um, are there any, uh, Anything else that we should say, or did someone have any questions? I don't see the Q and A, but um, yeah, Tila, what do you think? Yeah, um, if uh, we don't, I didn't see any Q and A in the chat because you all had such an amazing uh, discussion, um, <laughs> and so I'm just going to close us out. I want to say okay. thank you so much, um, Bridget and Lois, for joining us yeah. today. I'm um, really glad you guys were a perfect. Uh, pairing and such an important discussion that we had. I just want to remind people that this conversation is a part of a two-part series that's going to continue tomorrow um, at the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis. So uh, please feel free to join us there as well. This will be an in-person event. Uh, I think a link in the chat is going to drop with more details about that. Um, I want to give special thanks to Johnny Gabbard, who is the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equities Administrative Coordinator and who um, has made everything possible about this event today. Um, again, special thanks to Bridget Lois, to the Department of African and African American Studies, um, to the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis. Please, please go visit the Griot Museum. Um, we'll drop another link uh, to the Griot uh, Museum website. We did earlier, but just so you can have it. Um, and we hope you can join us for more exciting conversations like this in the future. Um, and we'll have a link to our calendar in the chat as well. But thank you, everyone, and have a thank good evening. You. Thank, thank you. you so Thanks much. for the opportunity.